welcome to another edition of Montpelier Civic Forum. It's that time of year again, and we're getting ready for the election on town meeting day, of which I always encourage you to get out and vote, even if that means getting out to your post box and putting the ballot in the post box and not actually getting out there on town meeting day. But do your civic duty, uh, do your due diligence. We've got some interesting shows this year, parks. We've got the Public Safety Authority. We didn't get the Cemetery Commission, uh, but we do have city budget. We have capital budget. We have school budget. We have school board. And um, we have city, uh, core city budget. But tonight, we're talking in District 3, and we're talking to one of the candidates. And we're talking to Carrie Brown. Carrie, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Who is Carrie Brown? <laughs> Tell me about yourself. <laughs> sure. Well, um, thank you. So I, I live on St. Paul Street. So I live in that funny little thumb of District 3, where most of it's on one side of the river, and there's this little bit that kind of sticks into downtown. So that's where I live. And I've lived there for, I've lived in Montpelier for 26 years and lived in our house on St. Paul Street for 22 years, I think. And... Um, I, we have two sons who are... How old? Well, my youngest just turned 18, uh -huh. so they're all grown the baby up is now. leaving soon? Yeah, yeah, and my oldest is 22. So um, it's, a, it's a different world having young adult children. <laughs> it's not quite the same thing. Where did you come from to get to Montpelier sure. 26 years ago? Yeah, well, um, so I grew up in... Uh, Washington DC when I was really young and then um, Massachusetts when in my the second part of my youth and so um, I, I've always my family uh, on my mother's side was from New England years and generations back so I've always felt like a New Englander even though I was actually born in the south technically because I was born in Washington DC but um, I, I ended up here because my husband, who is John Odom, who's the and who city is clerk. John Odom? Yeah. I know who John Odom yeah. is, but for those who do not know John Odom. Yeah, he's the city clerk in Montpelier. And, um, and just, a, just a quick aside as I stray from my, my little biography here, um, it, I, I, we have talked a lot about would there be some kind of a conflict of interest or is it a problem you know, for, for me to serve on city council and him to be city clerk. And the thing that we identified and I've spoken with other city councilors and with the mayor about this as well, is um, the portion of the city budget that's his, that's the city clerk's office, it would it be a clear conflict of interest for me to be voting on that, which includes his salary. So I would recuse myself from that portion of the budget and that could easily be separated out so that I didn't have to vote on that. Um, but so you could still vote on the total budget the after that had been Settled exactly, exactly, and I mean this is this is just how um, I envision solving that problem. And if there's another better, more elegant way to do it that we need to work out later with city staff and with city council, that's fine. But at any rate, this is something that we've thought about and addressed. Now, 26 years ago, did you meet John here? Uh, no. So John and I um, uh, were already married, and we 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 spent three years living in Portland, Oregon, and. Um, John wanted to go to Goddard. And so it's a common story I have found. People, Goddard is one of those things that brings people to Vermont. So we wanted to kind of come back to this part of the country. I really wanted to be back in New England. It felt very important to me. And so we came to Montpelier, not necessarily thinking we were gonna stay for a long time. You know, we really didn't have any kind of long-term plan. And then it's funny, he and I were just talking about this the other day. It's not so much that we decided we were going to stay forever. It's that it just sort of, we just never decided to leave. And I mean that in, the, in a very positive way. Like we got here and it felt very comfortable. And we just kind of started a life here in Montpelier. And it seemed like such a perfect place to be. And we bought a house and we had kids. And it's just, the, you know, the, one of the strongest communities I've ever been part of. Take yourself to when you arrived in my, it was the second wave from Goddard. The first wave was in the 70s. It was the second the wave. It yeah, was exactly. the second wave. Yeah. What was Montpelier like at that point? I don't think the, the horn in the moon wasn't around. Was it was. It, it was. It was okay. still here, yeah. The restaurant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. I miss that place, yeah. What else yeah. 
to find Montpelier um, in those days for you? Well, I remember at least two places to get really good bagels that we don't have anymore. I miss that. There was a lot of bagel eating in my youth. <laughs> and I remember um, downstairs video. And when we first moved here, we didn't Below the Savoy. Below the Savoy. Rick Winston. Yep. And when we first moved here, we didn't have cable. And, um, and internet was, it was in the mid-90s, so inter we weren't streaming Netflix or anything. And we made a lot of trips in those early days to downstairs video to get a video. What are we going to watch for tonight? And um, so that was, uh, I definitely miss that, but that was a different era. And, you know, but I don't feel like, when I think back to 26 years ago, it doesn't feel like a radically different place at all. You know, some of the, the scenes have changed. There's no downstairs video, but there's, um, the Savoy is still there, but also it's, the, the basic feeling to it is, is really the same. It just feels like a very welcoming, very comfortable, small town that has, a, but it, it, there's so much more going on here than a, than a town of its size you would expect. And obviously that's because we're the state capital and we're drawing in community from all around us. It's not just the folks that live here. And um, so that's one of the things I value so much about it. You were around for the classic fight at Elm and State over a McDonald's. Oh, I think we just barely missed that. I think that, because I remember hearing about it. Yeah, so I think that was right before we got here. Yeah, District three, most people, as you pointed out correctly, most people think the other side of the river. Right. Let's go to the other side of the river. Mm -hmm. What are the concerns that you see that residents on the other side of the river have, besides yeah. identity? Yeah, um, well, so that's a, that's a side, um, that's an area where traffic is a huge issue, and um, there are... Traffic speed. Tra traffic speed and congestion as well. So, so one of the things that I've been hearing about is commuter traffic, people on their way to and from, say, National Life, but other places as well that are being kind of directed through these little neighborhoods that were not at all designed for that kind of commuter traffic and it's just becoming more and more. And so I know that's a concern for people in some of these quiet little neighborhoods who are seeing lots of traffic back up around rush hour and seeing rush hours happen, you know, which that's something that didn't happen 26 years ago. Didn't have any sense of rush hour in Montpelier and you definitely get that now. And so, so that's definitely something that I hear about. And I know that with the proposed housing developments that they're talking about on Northfield Street, that's a huge concern for some of the folks who are living right around there is what is that going to do to the traffic? Is it going to be, is, you know, Derby Drive going to be just solid cars um, as well as just kind of that, uh, that feel of, of the neighborhood, you know, as well. And then another thing um, that I hear, and, oh, and, and um, the speed limit on Berlin Street, of course, is something that has been a really hot button issue that I think a lot of folks on Berlin Street don't feel is completely settled yet. But they feel at least it was, something was done on it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the neighborhood worked long and hard for that one. Yeah, exactly. And so that was a, a, a big win in a lot of people's eyes. And yet I think there's still, I know there's a lot of concern about traffic is still just tearing through there. You know, I mean, I, I experience it all the time. I drive 30 miles an hour on Berlin Street and there's always somebody right on my bumper who I can tell is cursing at me. Why are they going so slow? How do you think we you can know? address that? Or how would you recommend addressing it? <laughs> yeah. Whether, whether it would happen or not, yeah. how would you resolve that? Yeah. I mean, I think that there... I mean, we do have the flashing, you know, speed limit. So having a, a sign that flashes that tells you how fast you're actually going, those are incredibly helpful for um, helping people to slow down because you, especially on a street like that, when you're coming downhill, even more so when you really just don't realize quite how fast you're going. And, um, and I also think it's just gonna take some time for people to just kind of get used to the fact that that's actually what the speed limit is there. And with ongoing enforcement, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will just become a, a shift there. But it is hard because it feels like a kind of a through way, you know, and people are trying to get to work, trying to get to school. What do we do about Sherwood? What do we do about Sherwood? Which is the cut yeah, through. Yeah, I know that from one. There down to 302. Yeah. To, and imagine how those neighbors feel. Yeah, because people are cutting 
through there to get there. Yeah, I think that's a good example of one of those smaller neighborhoods that's taking a lot more traffic than it's probably designed for. So um, I'm not a traffic expert. I don't know exactly what we need to do about that, but that's the kind of thing that I think as we're thinking about overall infrastructure and any kind of development to that, that we need to be thinking about Which doing those studies. Per, I've heard people. I mean, maybe, maybe, I mean, not on Berlin Street. No, no, not right? certainly not on <laughs> Berlin Street. That wouldn't work, but maybe but sure in some would. of these smaller, maybe, maybe Sherwood, yeah. I mean, it, it's pretty windy, you know, and so um, I, it's not, that's not going to cut down on the, the number of cars that are going no, through there. No, but it might so. slow it down a tad. Yeah. District 3 is interesting because the housing stock is so different mm -hmm. than District 2. And in a sense, District 1 is a more recent housing stock, but District 3 is. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's any part of town that's vaguely affordable, it's District 3. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the housing stock and what the city can do for homeowners in District 3 because the problems are so different than homeowners in District 2 that have homes from the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. This is from the mid 20th century mm -hmm. and at this point things are going wrong, you know, at the 70 year mark that are different than things going wrong in the 100 year mark. Mm -hmm. Do you mean with people's individual houses? Yeah, with people's individual houses, yeah. with the plumbing, with, with yeah. the furnaces. How can we reach out to those homeowners? We reach out currently and do help with energy adjustments and things like that. Would you see uh, the push towards energy conservation extending to those houses on the other side? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there isn't there aren't any houses that that's not going to be appropriate for. and. Um, in terms of, um, again, this is an area where you're going to hit me not knowing the details about the kind of financing that there, that's available, or, you know, financial support. But um, uh, upgrading a house to increase its energy efficiency is, there are some things you can do that don't cost a lot of money, but for the things that are really going to make a big difference, that's a pretty significant investment. And so it's trying to do whatever we can to make sure that there is some kind of support for as for as wide a range of people as possible, uh, I think is important. And I, so this is the kind of thing where Montpelier doesn't have the funding to be able to do this by itself, but there's support at the state level and hopefully there's some kind of other support that we can advocate for that might be helpful with that. I also think that as we're looking at our infrastructure upgrades and developments, we need to be thinking about exactly the kind of thing that you're saying where you've got a house, it's a different kind of situation in a house, in a neighborhood with 150 year old houses than a neighborhood with 50, 75 year old houses. And so um, just to be conscious of that, whatever it is that we're putting into place or we're upgrading, that it's going to be something that makes sense still in whatever way we can 50 years from now, 100 years from now, as much as we can predict that rather than just kind of patching up what we have and hoping for the best. Well, we have a new energy consultant position that's yeah. been written into the budget. Yeah. Would you see that consultant steering towards your neighborhood, steering towards the neighborhood on the other side? I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because I think that, that you're absolutely right. There's it's a different kind of houses over there, different kind of, of housing stock, and the, the infrastructure needs are going to be different. So I hope so. Um, I expect that they'll be looking at the whole city. That would be my, my expectation, yeah. <laughs> when, um, when the wayfaring signs came, you know, the big downtown yeah. Montpelier yeah. sign and the signs that point you in different directions. Yeah. On two, there's a sign that points toward the business district yeah. beyond the Granite Street Bridge, the business district in District 3. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see, uh, forever, it's been the, the illegitimate stepchild of downtown. Mm -hmm. it, when they light up for Christmas downtown, they don't light that strip. Mm -hmm. At least they're recognized as a legitimate area. Has that strip entered your consciousness differently in recent years than 26 years ago? Oh, um, yeah, I think so. Because I, I would say that, you know, 26 years ago, it seemed like the way out of town, right? When I first got here. <laughs> and um, and now I, it's, it's not the way out of town. It's a 
integral part of town. But you're right that it's it's not like downtown, and it's um, you know there's a lot of just the way it's set up. You're a lot of people are kind of driving by things to get to somewhere else, and um, you know those signs are pretty interesting because some of the some of the ways that they labeled things don't necessarily line up with the way that people who live in Montpelier think of <laughs> these different parts of town. <laughs> so that's interesting. But um, take that up with Montpelier a lot. Yeah, exactly. That's that's fine. It's still I, I still like the signs, and I'm glad that they're pointing people to you know different parts of town, so you can kind of get a sense of rather than just there's this one way. If you're coming from the interstate and you tr turn onto the bridge by Shaw's and Sarducci's that seems like sort of a way into town, or you can come in by the state house, but then there's, there's lots of town left that you don't get to if you don't, um, if you only turn left and go across the river. I believe, and I know it actually, yeah. that you represent Bar Hill, that District 3 Is will extend right? on that side of, of Berry Street. Is that right? I thought yes, it was. Yes, that is. Yeah, okay. So, well, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, and that's a development yeah. that came on that side of town, a significant development, yeah. which walks me, I'm continuing east, to the Elks Club. Yes. What's your feeling on that? Well, I really hope that this um, vote passes. What is the Elks yeah. Club that I'm referencing? Yeah. Um, well, so this is the, the piece of land that... Um, the old Elks Lodge is on with a old golf course, and it's um, you know it's across from across Agway. from Agway. Yep, exactly. And I was actually out there the other day. There was a site visit that was held to kind of check out the site and and hear from some people about some of the thoughts that different people have about what could be done with it. Um, so the idea is that the city could buy this piece of property. And now, I don't want to screw then, you. Were on site. I wasn't. Yeah. yeah. 100 and how many acres? 138 acres. Okay. Yeah, that's what I remember. 138 mm -hmm. acres. Yeah. What is being discussed for that? So, I mean, I think this is actually something that's really important for people to understand, which is that nothing has been decided. And there is a lot of um, misconception, I believe, which, which is very understandable, because I think there have been a lot of folks speaking about what they would like to see happen on this site as though there are plans in place, but there, I know not from the city point of view, I mean, but kind of out in the community, that sort of talk has been going on. And so I think a lot of people have gotten the idea that some sorts of decisions have already been made, even though we haven't bought the property. It's not the case at all. No decisions have been made. So this, the, only, the only decision was to put this on the ballot so that the voters could decide if we want to get this bond to buy it. Your children were very young when Sabin's Pasture went up for sale. Yeah. Your children are now 18 and 22, and nothing has happened on Sabin's Pasture, but mm -hmm. a lot of talk. Mm -hmm. Do you fear that this Montpelier being Montpelier, that these people will be talking for years about what to do with this property? Well, no, I think that's, that's why the city should buy it. Uh, that's the key difference here, is if the city buys it, then it's, up, then it's our decision. Then we get to decide what happens with it. And so we have the, the, the power and the authority to say, this is what's going to work well for this community. This is what our community needs. This is the, kind of, the kinds of development that we want to see that express our values as a community, rather than hoping that uh, somebody else will do something that works well for Montpelier. Based on our zoning. Based on zoning, right? Yeah, because I mean, zoning is a is a very blunt tool. There's only so much you can really accomplish with that. Um, so I'm hopeful that that we do end up purchasing it, and then I think we need to really step back and take the time to do a lot of public hearings, have a lot of public. This input. is Mount This yeah, is yeah. the city I'm of sure. public hearings. Yeah. But but it's never it it's never quite enough, you know. There's it's really hard, and it's really easy to hear from the same people over and over again. And I'm hoping we can find some ways to hear from some of the people that aren't the usual suspects to find out what they would like to see. Um, the city budget, school budget, mm -hmm. taxes in general. This is an expensive place to live. It's a very expensive place expensive. to rent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have concern about a city budget that's 
9.7% and a school budget that's 4.5%? Um, so my, my concerns are about affordability overall. Um, and property taxes are a piece of that, but they're just one piece. And so I'm concerned about high rents, concerned about the high cost of purchasing a home, as well as high property taxes, which are just really just one component of the expense of living in Montpelier. Um, so I'm, in general, when it comes to the budget, what I, I would really like it if we could kind of step back from our usual way of thinking about, about budgeting and start from the end of what is it that we need and what is it that we want to do and then think about how do we find the money to be able to do that rather than starting from the point of view of how much money do we have and what can we do with it and it doesn't mean that we can you know come up with pie in the sky visions I was just about to then, say doesn't yeah. that re end up yeah. with a gated community yeah well well mm, I don't know that's an interesting question because I um, yeah, I don't know. I don't that I don't really follow. Uh, what I was saying yeah. is that if taxes, first of all, housing is so expensive around here that I assume <clears throat> that people will be. <clears throat> excuse me, Zach. I assume that people will be moving from other communities that where the housing is a lot more than it is here, and moving into our housing, yeah. and gradually lower income. Uh, Montpelierites, whose equity is sitting in that home, will be replaced by two-income families, and mm -hmm. basically we will gentrify to some degree. I'm worried about that. I'm very worried about that. Yeah, yeah. I think we're in, that's a serious concern for Montpelier. I think that's a direction we are already starting to head in. And that's part of why um, I want the city to be thinking about what kinds of influences it can have over how the housing works here. What kind of influences mm. do you think the city can have over any of these yeah. income issues except for the tax rate? Yeah, Oh well, we can have say over the kind of housing that we have here to some degree. So one way is to purchase that Elks Lodge property, in which case if we want affordable housing to be on that property, we can be in control of making it happen. Um, and. Uh, we can also look at zoning and look at if there are possible changes to zoning that are going to make it more conducive for people to build the kind of housing that's going to help with that. That's something that we can do like the, um, uh, and you know, we'll see what the, the zoning, what zoning proposals are coming down the pike that might affect that. And then uh, there are, I'm, I suspect that there is not as much that the city can do on its own as I wish I as it, I wish it could, but that I think that there are some partnerships that we can have with the state. There are probably some changes at the state level that we can advocate for. And again, this is an area where I don't know a lot of detail about what could be done, but uh, I know that there have got to be ways to do this. And and I don't want us to just kind of throw up our hands and say, well, that's just how it's going to be, and let it happen around us. Let's go back downtown again. Um, in the budget, in the capital budget this time, is a light at Barry and Main. Mm -hmm. And again, the idea being that it's nary impossible to get from Barry east, west, I'm sorry, during certain times of day. Yeah. And then when they put that light in, uh, they're going to retime the lights, all three lights, so that it makes a smoother traffic flow. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me. Yeah, if it works that way, that would be great. <laughs> Confluence Park yeah. is in yeah. there. Uh, yeah. Confluence Park being that area behind the Shaws, down towards the river, and there's a discussion of reevaluating the dams in the river to actually lift the river, and they're talking about the possibility of being able to put kayaks and canoes into the river. That's in the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, the parking garage is over. Yeah. What other changes would you like to see downtown that might improve our downtown, not only for residents, but for merchants and for visitors? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that, that we're on the right track. We're thinking about things like traffic um, and, Im and improving the, the way traffic moves through there. If we can 
if there are ways to reduce the amount of traffic that's going through, I'm not a traffic engineer. I don't know how that would be, but I think that's something to think about because we're just, we're just seeing more and more all the time. Um, and, and we need to make sure that it remains really walkable downtown as well. I, mean, I think we do a pretty good job with that once you're downtown, but to be able to kind of walk into town, if you live on North Northfield Street and there's a sidewalk and then there's not a sidewalk and then there's a sidewalk, you know, we need to, and I know that the city is working on plans to kind of take care of that around town, but those are kind of the kinds of things that would help. In the last year, um, we went into, we got rid of the school resource officer. Mm -hmm. We set up a, co a committee that was studying Montpelier policing. Mm -hmm. What's your feeling on, on the Montpelier police and its relationship with the schools and with, with the public in general? Yeah, so I think in general, um, police departments, not necessarily the Montpelier Police Department specifically, but in general, police departments um, need to be really focusing very hard on their relationship with the community and on the role that they play in the community. And um, I think that we as a community also need to be thinking about what exactly is it that we want from our police. And I think there's been, I mean, I know there's been a growing trend towards asking police departments to take care of all kinds of things aside from law enforcement. They're, you know, settling disputes between people. They're, they're acting like social workers. They're acting as, you know, mental health uh, counselors practically in some cases. And I think, and it's not, I don't think it serves any of us all that well. So I, I would like us to think about what are, again, what are the community needs and what's the best way to meet them. And sometimes a police officer is the best way to meet it. Sometimes it's not a police officer. And in the last budget, we shared a social worker with Barry who rides yeah. around with and works with our place close yeah. hand in hand. Yeah. In this budget, we have written another social worker position as mm -hmm. well as a peer position, which I'm not sure what that, that position would do. Yeah. But I think there is a recognition of exactly yeah, what you said. Yeah, there is. And you're on the same page as the rest of the council that's in support of Chief Pete's vision of community-based policing yeah. as a community engagement officer on his direct team now, mm -hmm. whose role is to liaison with the average citizen. You have coffee with the cop and, and all yeah. of that thing. Yep, yep. Would you I've be been seeing a lot more of that? that? Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely uh, the the direction that we need to go in. But I think we also need to be really looking at the other kinds of community resources and supports that we're providing for people, um, and that sometimes there are, you know, it's it's it, there are people who are going to have needs that can't be met by the police department, even by a social worker from the police, you know. And so we need to make sure that the connections between if the police are the ones who have the first contact with somebody who's got those needs or connections with them in mental health services and other kinds of community supports are strong enough that they can pass them off and, and make that link rather than still asking an employee of the police department to do it when it may or may not be the they best carry, one to They do actually it. carry a card on them that has yeah. all of the numbers of yeah. social services in yeah. our area. Good. So they Good. are ahead of that curve yeah. at this point. Um, what do we do? with the homeless population and with beggars on the street and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. How do we best address that as a community? Yeah. What, what's your feeling on that? So I don't have any easy answers to that. Obviously nobody does, but this is something that's changed in the time that I lived in Montpelier for sure. And, and I think it's, it's uh, reflective of much broader changes that are happening in, in our whole society and growing income disparities um, and a lot more people feeling like they just don't have uh, a place. And we're clearly not meeting their needs. And so I'm not an expert in this. I don't know exactly what their needs are, but I think we need to be finding out from the folks who work directly with the homeless people what it is that they need and what they want and, and asking them. Um, not that no one's ever asked them, but well, you know, we do have really a task force, a citizens task force. We do force have a task force. Yeah, it. yeah. And that has a budget, actually. Yep, I think exactly. 000. Yeah, and so I think that that's a that's a great place. We also have, you know, another way, and we have other community resources Good who Samaritan. are working. Yeah, exactly. 
And so finding out, so what is it, you know, not, I hear so many people have like big ideas about, we could do this, we could do that, but that don't necessarily come from the people whose needs we need to serve. So that's what I, that's what I think we really need to find out. And then I think a lot of it is just really basic immediate stuff. Like we need public restrooms downtown that are accessible. We need, people need to know where they are. I know there's a committee that's been working on restrooms or maybe there's a plan for a committee. I'm not really sure where no, that stands. No, it's written but... actually okay. into this budget. Okay, so it hasn't, hasn't yes, it actually... has its place. Yeah, yeah. Informally. Yeah, I well, believe I, it's you know, in the capital budget. I think I, that's that's good. Um, but then also people need a place to do their laundry, a place to store their stuff, and a well, place to take a shower. Well, they have places to do their they... laundry. Yeah. There's one on Elm Street. There's one on Berry Street. Yeah, but they need money to be able to do that, and they need you know. Um, we need to find out if what else it is that they need. So this is here again, me saying what I mm -hmm. assume people's mm -hmm. needs are, but that's the kind of thing that we need to we need to find out. But I think we need to focus on meeting people's immediate day to day needs, but then also be thinking about um, looking at the kind of the long term structure of the housing in Montpelier, and are there are there things that we can do to make sure that we have a variety of people living here who can afford to live here. Yeah. Um. As a city council person, the first in the spring you'll be facing um, the issues from the uh, commission that was looking at the place, the committee that was looking right. at the place. Mm -hmm. I want to highlight three of them and ask your opinion. Okay. Uh, decriminalizing intoxication, public intoxication. Yeah. Are you in favor of that? I'm in favor of that. Why? Yeah. Um, so in in general, my bias is going to be towards fewer things being criminalized than more things. That's just where I come from as a person. I think we, um, you, there, are not, there are a lot of problems that aren't solved well by making them into a crime. And, and that just seems like one of them to me. So, I mean, if, there's, if someone's causing a problem with, with their behavior and they happen to be intoxicated, then you know, their behavior is the problem. But just in, the so intoxication itself. So you would change itself, laws that are affected by the behavior. I, I'm thinking yeah. public intoxication in Montpelier aren't uh, the people in that parklet. They're people outside of Charlio's at one in the morning or two in the morning howling yeah. at the moon. Yeah, yeah. So is the howling at the moon the problem or is the fact that they're intoxicated the problem? <laughs> they're linked yeah. together, yeah, aren't but they? Yeah, but they're not because, uh, I mean, uh, the, the howling at the moon is the problem in my view. And so if that's, you know, disturbing the peace, if that's okay. causing some other, whatever the problem is that's caused by the behavior, that's the problem. Um, because somebody could, could do those things and without being intoxicated, right? Or vice versa. So, so yes, yeah, so I'd be in favor of decriminalizing public intoxication just on its own. Decriminalizing prostitution, that's in that report. Yeah, so, so, um, we have an ordinance. We have right an ordinance, now. and we have a state law on it. For we that yeah, and we have an interesting ordinance that says that women in Montpelier can't right. be prostitutes. It's fine for men to be prostitutes, apparently. In well, Montpelier. under state law, they can't. But under state law, nobody can be a right. prostitute. And so the state law covers all of that. And so it really doesn't matter whether we have that in our ordinances or not. So there's no. So this is a vestigial law, is what you're it, saying? It is, and there's no real. If we want to have the question about. I mean, we can't really have that conversation about should prostitution be legal or not in Montpelier because that's decided at the state level. We could have that conversation at the state level, and there are lots of people who are trying to have that conversation at the state level. But at the Montpelier level, um, it doesn't really matter whether it's in there or not. We can talk about getting rid of laws that are arcane. We can get, well, we can get rid of that law because it's, it's moot. You know, It doesn't matter whether that it's... it's a, we can't get rid of that ordinance because it's... It doesn't affect anything. A civilian police review board. Mm -hmm. What's your feeling on that? I, I've had council people on here mm -hmm. saying this is what the city council has done for years. And it's a very open city council that's responsive. I've read the report saying that there's more needed. Mm -hmm. Where would you fall on that yeah. if you were sitting mm -hmm. on city council? Mm -hmm. So um, I think in general that's a that's a good idea. I think having some kind of oversight that is uh, that is a mixture of people from the community and government, and not just. And I think right now there's enough concern about p 
police in general, again, not necessarily so much specifically about the Montpelier police, although I know people do have concerns as well. I think it's in general a good idea. Uh, there are some people who are on the other side of that who would say that's a good idea. Why don't we just go through the voters' roles and why don't we choose randomly and whoever wants to serve on that committee as you have a jury that would be a jury of your peers. It's yeah. not a jury of people who are expert in the legal profession. Mm -hmm. And in terms of judging the police, these would just be ordinary Montpelier people with their understanding of what public law would be. Which mm -hmm. would you see? Um, so something that combines the best of both of those it, it may be a good way to go. Um, and again, I'm not going to say exactly what I think this this board should look like because I don't know enough about it to be no able one to say. Knows. That, that's, it's still a concept. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in general, like at the state level, so I work for the state and so I see a lot of, the, you know, in the legislature they're creating commissions and boards and task forces and working groups all the time. And it's pretty common to have the experts, the people who have lots of experience working on it, and then to include some um, members from the public, just people at large, who you know, may or may not have any direct experience with this, but have an interest in it. And so, so I, I do think that can often be a really good way to go about it, but I wouldn't want to just, um, you know, it, make it all one or the other. If you were on council, council people are not only on council, they're on committees. Yep. Which one would you like? I there's so many yeah. committees. Uh, there's the parks. Yeah. There's the libraries. There's the homeless task force. Yeah. Uh, there's a plethora of recreation. There's a, mm -hmm. a plethora of places that council people. Which would you find your interest in? Yeah. I mean, I'm really, really uh, drawn towards issues around housing and um, and homelessness and you know just access to to being able to live in Montpelier. So that's really where. I'm, I'm very interested right now, but I mean, honestly, all of it sounds interesting to me if I just sit down and think about it. And, to, and so I'll be happy wherever I end up. I don't know what the process is for deciding who gets on which committees. So Well, I would imagine you'd open. be the low person on the totem pole. I would, that's exactly what I would think, yeah. <laughs> so really, I don't think you have the broadest choice. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm assuming. And what would you champion? What's one change? I know that everybody who runs for council has to have something in mind mm -hmm. that they would champion in that first year. Yeah. What would it be for you? Um, what piece of policy, yeah. what specific idea would you put forth? Uh -huh. Well, as I mentioned before about our budgeting process, I would really like us to think about a needs-based budget process where we're really thinking about what are the needs of our community and then think about how we go about meeting them. And as part of that, having as open a, pol a, a process as possible for finding out what those needs are. And that's not at all a criticism of the way that it's done now, because I think the city council is really pretty uh, quite open about how they um, go about their business, but that there are m proactive steps that you can take to really reach out to people so that it's not just the same people who are coming to the city council meetings, it's not the people who have Zoom, but you know, to try to get that kind of input. Well, the normal city council budget is incremental. I mean, you're discussing on the margin. You know, I, basically, last year's figure right. is this year's figure right. uh, plus right. or steady. Exactly. I, exactly. I don't see a you're whole just lot kind of cutting. making adjustments to what you already How have. How would yeah. you evolve yeah. to that kind of budgeting it's, from uh, a mind frame yeah. that for years has been last year's budget is yeah. our model? And we're going to either stay stable or add. Yeah, uh, it, it's 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 a it would be a project, and I don't a long -term know project. a long term project. I don't know how other people on the council would feel about it. So it may be that I'd be the only one advocating for that, but it is something that I, I would like to speak pretty strongly for because I feel like it's really important. And I want to thank you for coming and speaking with us. It's been a great conversation, yeah, and thank, thank you. you for watching Montpelier Civic Forum. And I'll end the way I always begin: get out and vote. Her husband will be happy if you do get out and vote. Uh, you can vote by ballot, by the mail. You can vote by ballot, by the hand on town meeting day, which this year is March 1st. Do watch the other shows because they're really interesting. Um, talk to your friends, talk to your family, engage yourself. Thank you very much.